Happy New Year. You are tuning in to the first episode for 2021 of Make Mondays Interesting. This also happens to be the season two premiere of the podcast. And I'm super excited for this year and this season and all the guests that I currently have lined up. Uh, Later in this show or later in this episode, I have a special guest. But before I bring them on, I really want to say that a new year means a new me. A new me means new endeavors. In On January 1st of this year, 2021, I released my 100th episode of Welcome to Denzel's World, which is my vlog series. Now, that's worth a watch. I encourage you, along with episode 98, to understand a little bit about myself or to understand more about me and the business, the production company that I've been trying to set up, which you know as, as God-given talent. One of the commitments I made to myself in that video and the video about having videos that you guys, the audience or whoever watches those videos keeps me accountable to that commitment is that I need to be valuing experiences over money. I learned the hard way last year that money doesn't bring happiness. Now, this is me not trying to say that you should burn all your money and live off the land because money is bad. But my hope is from this episode, when you either watch or listen, is that you are encouraged to be smarter with your money. Now, we all know the famous saying, work harder. No, 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 I'll say it. Work smarter, not harder. I was about to butcher that famous saying. Um, So yeah, one of the cool things for me and for God-given talent, I should say, in 2020. Now, I should also, a bit of disclaimer, in terms of 2020, yes, it was an awful year, but we shouldn't look at the year and think, oh, this is a year I want to forget. Let's make it a year to remember of what did we learn in that year, what challenges presented itself, and how they're making me a better leader, a better person in 2021. So don't completely ignore and forget about 2020. Learn from those experiences and bring them into 2021 it actually gives us more to look forward to when we never forget the challenges that we had faced so um that's a bit of a side point which is very important i really want to just say that real quick but something that 2020 has taught me or not i wouldn't say taught me but allowed for god-given talent to grow is that if it wasn't for the pandemic and if it wasn't for everyone going on to doing zoom calls I probably would not have set it up a podcast. I probably would not have had this show, the Make Mondays Interesting podcast slash show, whatever you wish to call it. I would not have had it without the pandemic. Because, well, I think what helped is that because everyone was forced to use Zoom, even the big production companies, news companies used Zoom, which therefore allowed me to use Zoom and use the audio from Zoom interviews as a podcast. And people had no issues with it because they weren't like, oh, it should be podcast quality with professional microphones. Um, Now we're up to that stage now, but people had a bit more grace because everyone became used to Zoom, Zoom audio, really. They became used to it and they were okay with it. So 2020 allowed me to do a podcast um, with confidence that... It doesn't matter how it sounds. Now, the point I'm trying to make in saying this is that obviously I mentioned about doing this thing called Welcome to Denzel's World. If you don't know what that is and you've only listened to my podcast, well, that is a series of vlogs that I've been doing since the start of 2019. And yep, I just reached my episode as I mentioned. So I was doing that and then now I was doing a second stream of content creation podcasting and the vlogging so I had two separate streams and 2020 allowed for that to happen so what does that mean well two separate styles of content that can exist on their own and generate their own income now I'm not going to go too much deeper into what I'm talking about right now because the guests I have on today now mind you this second part of this podcast or this episode was recorded last year late last year in december 
but the wisdom from that conversation is relevant forever, in my opinion. So my guest today is Greg Brown, who worked in an industry that was severely affected by COVID-19. However, wasn't too badly um, affected himself personally because of his smart investments. A smart, his wisdom, you could say, in terms of handling his money. Now, as always, I am your host, Denzel Gaga. This is a God-given talent production brought to you by Pamelia Accountants, financial solutions for your family. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say from my point of view about 2020. Now, enjoy the rest of this episode because there's a whole lot of gold that you will enjoy. Greg, how are you going? Well, yeah, well, yeah. going well now. It's been an interesting year, um, as for many of us. Mm. Um, we've been doubly affected. Um, I work for uh, the airline industry and also um, my partner is in the entertainment industry. So both of us have been hugely affected and still to this day are somewhat. But um, mm. there are some signs and some green shoots. So hopefully things will improve into 2021. Yeah. yeah. It has been a very interesting year. Yeah. So just to give a bit of context. So you said you worked in the airline industry. Yep. Particularly what company i know but for the people who don't know i work for qantas in the international division yeah so i'm an onboard customer service manager mm. and uh, i've been with qantas now for 31 years mm. i started on the ground in sales in adelaide south australia and then transferred to air crew about five years after that so yep. um, originally sydney based and now we have a brisbane base for about the last 15 or 17 years so I've been flying out of Brisbane for that period. So, of course, being international, that's going to be the last to come back. Our yep. domestic operation is starting to return really, really quickly now, mm. which is great news now that all the borders are open and people are getting the confidence to travel again. But mm. international is still quite a way off. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're still trying to even work out a, a bubble with New Zealand, let alone going any further afield than that. So, yeah. But hopefully that will all happen sometime into next year. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. And... I'm curious, being international, like what kind of countries have you traveled to? Well, you know, in the beginning of my flying career, Qantas flew to a lot more countries than they do now. Mm -hmm. Now, like a lot of industries, uh, they've partnered up with other companies and yep. in our case, other airlines to still cover the world, but on like code share flights and sharing mm -hmm. that flying. So, um, for example, from Europe, Another carrier will bring customers down from Europe to Asia and then we will bring them Asia to Australia so they won't come all the way and we don't go all the way, so to speak. But in the beginning when I started flying, we were flying pretty much most of the world. Mm. So um, not so much now. But back then, yeah, all through Europe, um, Africa, uh, the States, the Pacific, Asia. Um, yeah, pretty much... Yeah, a lot of places, a lot of yeah. good memories. Yeah, <laughs> And you got to do all of them? That's on the list? I did. I think I pretty much got to do everything. I didn't get to um, Buenos Aires. I've been there for holidays, but I didn't get there while we were flying there. Yep. We don't fly there anymore. We fly to Santiago instead. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, most of them all through Africa, Johannesburg, Harare, when we used to fly to Harare. Mm. Um, yeah, all through Europe when we flew to Frankfurt, Paris, Belgrade, wow. Athens, Rome. Yeah. All countries so, that I want to go and visit. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, because the good thing back then was that um, it's great that the industry is now inventing and developing aircraft that fly further. Yeah. But what that means is there are less stops. Yeah. So back when I started flying like 30 years ago, um, there were many more stops because aircraft couldn't go that far mm. so we would we would spend time in more places yeah so you know a london trip would be a 10 or 11 day trip round trip mm. whereas now they're flying direct to london now you know yeah. you literally have 18 24 hours there if you're lucky and you fly back wow. so it can all be over in four days yeah um so whereas we would stop along the way and you know mm. even up to the states uh, to, to the u.s now they're pretty much all direct flights but mm. in the beginning we used to stop in you know, Fiji or Hawaii or Tahiti, uh, New Zealand yeah. on the way up and on the way back. 
yeah. or even a couple of them. But now it's just direct up, direct back. So it's great for shorter flying, but it's eliminated the, the good times for us. <laughs> yeah, because I guess it means you don't get to see as many countries anymore. No, because you overfly now most yeah. of the world to get where people are going, yeah. Mm. And how long between flights would you get to ex- get to experience that country? Um, when we're away yeah. in, a, in a slip port. Um, you know, there are, there are rules around our rest periods, so mm. we've got to have a minimum rest period. So it depends on the f- length of the flight yeah. that you've just operated. A shorter flight, you need a less rest period, obviously, and the time change, the time mm. zone change. It's, there's, a th- there's a formula. But generally, we would get, you know, 48 hours yeah. uh, in a place. Uh, if it's a shorter flight, you might just get 24. Mm. Yeah. yeah, And sometimes it could be longer, yeah. depending on the frequency of the flight. If it's not a daily flight, obviously you need to wait for the next flight to come through. Mm. So if it's three or four flights a week, you might end up with 72 hours or 96 hours, three yep. or four days, yeah. There you go. So when you were touched down in a country, what was your go-to list of things to tick off? Was it always go find the best coffee shop right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I, you know, I, I like sightseeing, but I also like getting out and, mm. and being with local with the local people. So yep. I, I tend to usually look for, and I'm not a great shopper, yep. so I wouldn't, like some people would, sort out you know the nearest or best markets or shopping malls or whatever i I have never been into that Mm. um i've only ever shopped by necessity rather than recreation so but yeah i tend to look for the social places where people go and 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 you know i'm happy to sit yeah i'm happy to sit and have a coffee and watch uh people watch rather than you know and spend time in a shop or or you know and and i like wandering around museums and all uh, and art galleries but i would still prefer to be out with mm. the people and experiencing that sort of thing. So wherever the people are, that's where I tend yeah. to be, yeah. And I always look up before I go to a port, just Google search what's happening in that port mm. on those particular days in case there's something special happening, yeah. you know, a festival or a display or yeah. or a concert or, or whatever it might be, yeah. Mm. That's yeah. cool. That seems like a life that some probably people desire to be able to travel, but it's probably not also luxury, correct? Yeah, well... It, it is and it was yeah. and I'm glad I, I, I did it when I did. You yeah. know, now, as I said, it's becoming less opportunity to do more of those things yeah. because we're flying to less places, we're spending less time in those places mm. and we're working harder because mm. there are less people working on board an aircraft than there were, you know, 25, 30 years ago. So, mm. you know, when everybody arrives at a port now and you get to the hotel, we're staffed, you know. We used to have parties on the bus going from the airport to wow. the hotel. Now everybody sleeps, yeah. going, you know, because it's a different world. So you tend to need to reserve time in a port now to rest as well before yeah. your next flight, whereas before we had time to do both. Mm. Now you have to prioritise and think, okay, I'll pop out and do these few things, but I really need to come back and have a rest or mm. a bit of a snooze before I operate back, especially if it's a night flight. Yeah, mm. There you go. Yeah. Well, it is, it's changed, hasn't it? Yeah. So when would you say that change kind of came in? Well, it started with the advent of US direct flights. Mm. Um, and so the 747 probably heralded that. Um, but it was still wasn't able to fly to Europe nonstop. Mm. The, the west coast of the USA was pretty much as far as it could go. Yep. And even at times with weather, it would have to divert into Hawaii or Tahiti Mm. Um, because of fuel or, or other concerns. But now with the 787 and, and the long-range, extended-range aircraft, mm. so probably that all started to change. Well, it started to change the 747, but re- in real effect with extended-range aircraft, probably about 15 years ago was yep. a real beginning. And then, um, yeah, it's just kept on going since then because now, no, I don't think any airline in the world is is interested in buying any other aircraft than something that's extended range, long range. Because mm. yeah. they could still operate short range if they need them, yep. but they've got that flexibility to operate further. Mm. Yeah. There you go. It's things that I think the ordinary folk wouldn't know about how yeah. the aircraft industry works and yeah. um, the business behind it, having to, yeah, yeah. how we're, what's it called? Not doing so much time spent stopping but more just direct and correct it's changed completely it's all about the economies and aircraft that are cheaper to run fuel wise because mm. fuel now is such an expensive commodity worldwide so for an airline fuel is their number one expense mm. 
above anything else wages anything yeah it's fuel so airlines employ a lot of people specifically Mm. in one department to manage that fuel so they'll hedge it they'll hedge pricing so i'll lock in pricing or they'll keep some fluctuated just to to cover those costs because it can really make or break an airline so buying an aircraft now the aircraft manufacturers are all about selling Mm. the fact that these aircraft are cheaper to run fuel wise and economically and those sorts of things so flying non-stop is also cheaper than Mm. on fuel than than stopping along the way they're getting the same fare but spending less money Mm. cool well i've got a few questions to ask you but before we transition away from the airline talk i'd love to hear if you've got any i've got two questions yeah one of them is what has to be your favorite country that you managed to visit whilst working at Qantas? That's one. And then another question would be, do you have any cool, amazing, fun stories or slash meet anyone interesting whilst traveling? Yeah, I mean, what was the first one? We'll do the first one first. Favorite country. That's right, country. <laughs> Look, I'm a big Asia fan, but I've got to say my fondest memories of flying were the days when we flew extensively through Europe Mm. Um, we used to get to spend you know because of the length of the flight we used to get to spend three or four days there Um, and we used to hire cars and you know drive along the you know the Rhine or the Moselle Mm. or or, you know drive down into Italy and Mm. and have some great times so um, we had some really good memories there but I'm a big Asia fan too so anywhere in Asia for me I'm happy Japan Hong Kong yeah China yeah there you go Japan's a nice place with Beautiful. nice food. <laughs> Beautiful. So, yeah. and then any interesting Stories, people? Yeah, I mean, I've met, I've met obviously over that period of flying. Yeah. I've met. Um, Are you allowed to name names? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess I haven't. I by choice, I haven't done a lot of US flying. I'm yeah. not a big fan of the US. Yeah. I love New York, but I'm not a big fan of the West Coast. Mm. So, I've we have a bidding system flying, so yeah. we bid for trips and those sorts of things. Oh, wow. So. So I've mainly bid in the Asian area yep. and being a Chinese speaker, that sort of allowed me to do that. Mm. Um, but most people meet celebrities or famed people on the US route because yep. that's where they're going up and back down, whether they're a, an actor or an entertainer mm. or whoever they are. So, you know, I've met, I've met the Kylie Minogue's and I've hey, met the, you, you know, I've met the sports people yep. and all the, you know, um, I haven't had any royalty on board. Um, yeah, <laughs> but others have. Um, yeah, so I haven't done a US flying, so yeah. I, I haven't met a lot of, of those True. people. Yeah, um, and times on board, memorable times on board. I've had, you know, the most memorable for me are, are the ones that, being an onboard manager, the ones that have 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 caused me um, <laughs> some concern. Um, and on board, it's a very different um, flying. In an aircraft, working in an aircraft is a very different scenario to working on the ground. You know, yeah. we're at, we're at forty thousand feet. We don't have security. Mm. We don't have medical backup. It's not easy. You can't just ring on the phone. Oh, yeah. you know, can you send security? Can you send an ambulance? Whatever. Mm. We have to deal with that on the spot wow. in a confined space, managing three hundred other people at the same time. Yeah. So you know, the biggest challenges on board are things like medical emergencies. Um, touch wood i've never had anyone i haven't ever lost anybody on board that's good <laughs> that's good um but it happens but i have had medical emergencies we've had we've needed to divert to offload somebody for medical urgent and medical attention and call on medical practitioners on board to assist us mm. we are trained as managers on board we're trained in in operation of defibrillator and basic yep. um, use of our physician's kit but we need a qualified ph- physician to to do a lot of the things yep. on board and to administer a lot of the uh, of the drugs um so that and security issues you know mm. where we've had to um restrain somebody in flight um and then again either divert or keep them restrained until wow. we arrive at our next port to have them offloaded by the authorities wow so they're the biggest challenges as i said because you're you're at forty thousand feet it's yeah. a very different environment you can't call for backup yeah you have what you have on the day resource wise yeah. you might not that females are any less capable, but you might have a, a total female crew. You know, mm. it's just the way it comes out on the day. Some yeah. days it's, it's like that. Um, and some people handle it better than others. And mm. whilst we're trained in security, until it happens, yeah. you never quite know how people are going to react. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Is it like the movies? Like I've seen flight movies and there's like an air marshal. If that is, if that's probably a US thing. And then they always, and then they get in the PA of like, does anyone know medicine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that well, true? we do do the PA. We do do the PA, yeah. uh, medical PA, if we believe uh, the basic first aid that we're trained in yeah. and the facilities that we're able to access on board are insufficient mm. or not working or not, not hard enough, then we then we do make a PA for um, uh, a medically trained professional. Yeah. Um, and that's the good thing. Usually mm. on board a flight, you'll get, you know at least three or four sometimes a dozen doctors wow. will 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 offer to yeah. to help um and sometimes you'll be lucky enough somebody who's a specialist or an, a nurse on board who specializes in in dealing with that particular problem whether it be mm. cardiac or whether it be you know whatever it is so mm. um that usually isn't an issue but yeah we do that um yeah there you go yeah. probably like the a lot of these nurses and doctors think can't travel anywhere without having to do exactly but it's voluntary that's why we make the pa anyone you know is anyone prepared to assist Mm. um so it's all voluntary basis and then you know we um we obviously uh, look after them after that but um yeah it's a voluntary Mm. thing so no one is no no one's forced to or 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 obliged to yeah yeah Yeah. there you go um i want to change subjects now and if 2020 has taught us anything, I think prior to 2020, we probably would have thought, you probably thought the same thing. It's the airline industry is a stable industry. Nothing can go wrong. Mm. And then it just took a pandemic out of nowhere to realize no industry is safe mm. economically. Um, and so, and part of the reason why I want to get you on the show was because I know that you have some investment properties, correct? And that you also have a business as well outside of working at Qantas. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to ask about that. Let's first talk about, let's talk about the business first. Yeah. Um, I know that you talked, you mentioned how your partner Daniel is in entertainment. Yep. And so it's you two, you two are basically doing it together. Correct. More, probably more so him. Correct. Um, so tell me about that. Yeah. Well, it started back when I met Daniel, um, actually in Hong Kong on a trip. Yeah. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 25 years ago, 25 years ago. Wow. So Daniel's a professional performer and, of course, was in Hong Kong. Mm. So he was there on contract uh, doing a couple of uh, contracts and freelancing on the side. So he was working with the Hong Kong Opera Society and, and mm. a few other um, things. So we met and, and that was my first introduction to the entertainment industry. Yeah. So as that sort of relationship went down further and I became more involved, Mm. it became very clear to me very quickly that entertainers, whilst they are very talented and very, Mm. very capable at what they do, are not necessarily very good managers. Mm. Um, And they can be very creative, but the admin side of it um, usually is what lets them down. And that's Mm. why you find a lot of entertainers, unfortunately, live their lives week to week, gig to gig. Mm. Um, they have very few, have long-term plans. If you ask most entertainers, unless those, you know, that already made it yeah. and are being managed, if you ask most at street level, what's their plan for the next five years mm. or 10 years, where do they plan to be? Most will just shake their head and say, I've never ever thought about that. I yeah. don't know. I'm just thinking about next weekend, wow. you know. So it became very clear that um, whilst I had no direct uh, experience in the entertainment industry mm. that the skills I had in management were really the same skills required. I just had to build up my understanding of the industry and yep. the contacts in that industry, yep. uh, which I've done over, you know, over the, over the, the last 20 years. Um, but, yeah, the management skills basically remain the same. So, yeah, Daniel does most of So we have DNG Entertainment, mm. so it's a partnership thing. So Daniel basically looks after the creative side of the business mm. because that's what he's good at, yep. being a performer. Um, he will often ask me for for, for, uh, for ideas or what I think about that, but basically he's the creative. Yep. And then I get all the boring stuff, basically. So I get all the, um, you know, the bookings and inquiries yep. and marketing and accounting and tax and GST and best statements and all those things. <laughs> um 
uh, marketing and, and whatever. So it yeah. works well because, you know, I'm I'm not necessarily all that good at what he does mm. and he's not necessarily good at what yeah. I do. So, <laughs> so it's a balance. It's yeah. a good healthy balance by the yeah. sounds of it. Yeah. And look, it's really hard for... The other thing is if you're an entertainer, it's very, very hard to represent yourself yeah. especially where you're negotiating mm. on fees and conditions and things yeah. like that to no matter what industry you're in if mm. if you're negotiating for yourself it's always it's um it's always a little bit awkward yeah um like it's easier if somebody else who's separate from that can do it on on your mm. part um then it it, it it doesn't um identify with you as much yeah 100 yeah. percent agree it's kind of like the whole awkwardness of i don't want to make out that i'm worth so much more than yeah. but then the manager sees the value you are so yeah. they value what you should be at yeah where we tend to if we're just doing it ourselves tend to devalue ourselves yeah. so it's you're so spot on about that yeah. um and do you find it to be a healthy mix not purely just doing um working at Qantas, but having something else to come home to to then yeah. work on yeah because they're very different um they're both people related and uh at Qantas it's very much people related and at Qantas it's it's very very um uh procedure driven yeah. you know whether it's on board or whether it's safety related duties or whatever that's what that's what air crew do that's what they're trained to do mm. so and i th- digressing during this pandemic and during COVID, and while most crew have been stood down since march and some of them have gone on to look for secondary employment. Mm. One con- consistent thing you hear from employers is we love Qantas crew mm. because they're just so disciplined. They they are procedure driven. Yeah. They will take a set of procedures and just run with it. Yeah. They don't question things. They just they just do it. So um, they're reliable. They're you know. Um, so I think a lot of those skills that probably crew have just taken for granted because they've done it for so long and they get trained several times a year and recurrent courses, mm. it's really, you know, carried them in good stead forward. So for me, outside of Qantas, I take a lot of those things with me. So yeah. I just naturally think in terms of, um, you know, there's got to be a procedure for everything and there's got to be a, a step list for everything. Mm. It's not just, you know, suck and see or we'll just... We'll just go for it and yeah. it'll end up the way it is you know there's always a there's always a plan there so um i think that's probably helped in, in some of that crossing over between the two um but you know i enjoy entertainment as well so it's yeah. a great venue uh, a great place to work at because i tend to try to go to a lot to a lot if not most of the performances yeah um, we have different, a lot of different styles of performances as well. So I try to get there and, you know, I enjoy being part of that as well. Yeah. Mm. There you go. Because I guess it, it breaks up the norm if you were to just do the one thing. Yeah. Because then you have something to go to. Yeah. Um, and as we've learnt from this year, uh, something in a way you can fall back on because the industry, the airline industry just shut down. Yeah. <laughs> instantly. Correct. Um, and so... What's your thoughts on the importance of having something to fall back on? Look, I think it is important and even just within the entertainment industry yeah. we've seen that because we do, um, some of our acts do quite a lot of cruising as well mm. and of course the cruising industry has, yeah, true. has just collapsed. So whilst the entertainment industry is starting to crawl back now mm. uh, and hopefully that will continue without setbacks, um, the cruising industry is still way behind that Mm. because of obviously obvious issues so there are some entertainers i know that have been by choice going cruising pretty much all year round yeah so they haven't been working on the ground so now that they're on the ground and they haven't worked on the ground for so long nobody knows them yeah so they're trying to now compete with everybody that's been around for so long so again even to that point even within one industry putting all your eggs in one basket Mm. can be a little bit dangerous. And I've always said that, you know, like if we've got an act going out cruising and they get lots of offers, I say, well, you know, we'll just do some here, some there. Uh, Not, you know, I've always been like that even well before any thought of this happening. Mm. That let's just share between the two because you need to be established 
in both areas. So yeah. if one falls apart, you've got the other, you know. Mm. Um, and cruising has been so huge now for a few years. A lot of people have just gravitated to that. Yeah. But now they're forced to come back. Yeah, true. No matter who they are, how, who, how good they are, mm. people don't know them. People mm. haven't heard of them. Yeah. And they're competing with all these people who are already established. Mm. And obviously, they're the ones they're going to consider first. Mm. So it's important not to... to strike, and that's why even as a management company, we we manage different acts and different styles of acts. So if, there's, yep. if, if the demand is... Um, is there for some something else you can still cover it yeah so you've got to be flexible mm. yeah that's cool i didn't even think about the cruising industry yeah. i think we always think about flying but yeah i didn't even think about yeah. cruising um and that's and that's a smart uh point to take away in regards to not having all your eggs in one basket especially within the industry yeah because then you've got to differentiate yourself wear many hats in a way Correct. To, so that when the time comes to wear a different hat, at least you've worn it so you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And investment properties. So mm. I'm not sure how many you have. Is it just the one? Well, or we're, starting to, we're starting to wind down now yeah. because, you know, I'm, I'm sort of winding down my uh, some of that part of it but yeah. at that end of, uh, of my career. But um, we... At one stage, the most we've had at one stage is four, mm. um, and then we've, we're gradually reducing those. So, yeah. yeah, I bought my first investment when I was 20, I think. Uh, I was living in Adelaide at the time, mm. and we lived in the northern suburbs, and I went for a drive on my own one day to the southern suburbs, and there was a big development area there, one of the, I forget which developer, and um, they were selling box of land for, yeah. I think, you know, $12,000 or something. And oh, I just... That's cheap. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, this was <laughs> a lot of years ago. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Um, and I just signed on the spot, you know. And I remember driving. I was living at home at the time and I drove home and I told my parents, and they're going, what? What? What did you buy down there for? Who'd live down there? And I said, well, I don't intend to live down there. It's an investment. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a growing area. That's where all the families are going. That's where all the families are building. Mm. It's an investment. And, um, and about... Five years after that, I moved to Melbourne to take up a job offer at uh, National Bank Travel, mm. and um, I decided to sell the block of land to give me more deposit to buy a unit in in mm. Melbourne in South Yarra. So you know, in five years, I you know, the the land I think you know quadrupled in price yeah, in wow. five years, and it gave me a really handy deposit to buy to buy mm. that unit. So, and then when I went on working more and I started to earn more, my income became more as I went into management roles, I just decided I was paying too much tax. Mm. So the only way to offset that was by an investment property mm. where I could offset some of that tax and at the same time, hopefully, um, make some capital gain yeah. over a period of time. So, yeah. Mm. That's smart. Because um, I think we can... I was having a conversation someone the other day about it because i'm in that position 20 21 year old yep. looking to still saving up to be able to afford because the prices now aren't yeah. as cheap as yeah, probably yeah. when you did but it. it's all relative <laughs> yeah it's still still the same um but um you know we had a good conversation about i think some of so often people can get fall on fall into the trap of just working at one job mm -hmm. and having earning a single income and then paying rent yeah. and never looking to own a home and because i think we just associate owning a home as in living it in ourselves but yeah. we can't just limit it to that we can own a home and let other people live in it Correct. for the return of the investment um and so something i'm still working towards to be able to do that but i know I'm, i want to do that with my life is yeah. to not have one single source of income but multiple streams where whether it comes through investment properties um whether it comes from starting a business on my own um you know just working a regular job too at the same time like i think it's super super important to yeah. have those multiple streams of income um yeah what what someone that's a bit more experienced in in age than i am um 
what would your advice be for me as a 20 year old yeah no i think you're right i think it's it's no matter what age it's very easy to get in into that trap of just going to the same job each day mm. coming home with the same pay packet each week and with the same expenditure each week whatever mm. you know, on groceries on rent and or whatever it might be so i think you're right you've got to you've got to look at other opportunities to um how you can still do that but change it up whether it be another job on the side or a bit of business on the side or um work collaborating with somebody mm. uh to start that and and you know you can st- some people are, will actually have an investment property um it, you know it might just be a one bedroom unit or whatever it is um and then still rent you mm. know the, themselves you know because that's what what works for them mm. so i think the hardest thing is getting your foot in because once you get a foot in and you have an investment then it's easier then to um, use the capital on that investment mm. to then move on to a second investment, whether that's a business or whether it's property or whatever it is. Mm. So the important thing is getting that first one so you've got some capital because yeah. um, most lenders, will, as we know, will look at you know your income and your and your capital. They're the two things, the only two things they're really interested in. So. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's just finding ways to, to get in and to get that in, that first investment, whatever it is, um, and then working on that as that capital gradually increases, yeah. bouncing off that capital to do something else. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Um, I'm not sure if I've asked this question. Well, I guess it's kind of we've already kind of been talking about it, but I guess the final question that I have to summarize everything we've kind of talked about is you know what would you say so because we're filming this in december 2020 so it won't come out till 2021 january Mm -hmm. which is when everyone has their new year's resolutions um and so what would you say to anyone who wishes to not be caught in the trap you could say the rat race of just doing the one thing being very limited Mm -hmm. with how much money is coming in what would you say to someone to start 2021 financially more prepared yeah well i th- i think for most of us it should be easier to do that mm. this year because we've we've gone through what we have this last year so most of us have learned that we need we are capable we just need to be flexible in yep. what we do um a lot of us were stood down lost our jobs and you can't just sit there and think i'll just wait for this to come back this is yep. what I do. This is what I've always done. I'll just wait for it to come back. You need to be more, um, more flexible and mm. open-minded about what we what we can do. Yeah. Um, and part of that is training. And and the great thing now that I, I've I've learnt this year too is that there are so many online training courses mm. now in just about anything, anything at all. Um, it's for free, most of them. Exactly, either free or of a very competitive price. You know, so that. That's something that's never been available before too. So I think it's a great opportunity as well to to enlighten ourselves and to move on to try other things, yeah. um, to train in other things. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the message would be just be open-minded and just because this is what we originally trained in or had our hearts set in, mm. that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we have to do forever. Mm. You know, we might come back to it at some stage or we might do it on the side but there are other things we can do. Mm. Um, and there are lots of, lots and lots of assistants out there now, uh, even me, I'm, I'm, because I'm not used to that. Yeah. Um, you tend not to think to ask, but there is so much out there that we can use resources to, to build our own toolkit, you mm. know, and, and the, more, the more we have in our toolkit, then the more we're capable of and the, and the more places we can go and do. You know? Yeah. That's a great analogy to end on. The toolkit. The toolkit. <laughs> I'm keeping that as a analogy that I pass on to other people that I meet and Correct. talk to. <laughs> Correct. More tools in the toolkit That's to be right. able to do more jobs. Correct. And to not be so limited in our knowledge or limited in our skill set. Yeah. Um, something that I'm still learning as a young person is what more skills can I learn? What more things can I learn? What more... Uh, 
yeah, I just said this. What more things can I do? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, and sometimes yeah. it's not just about what you learn. Mm. It's about what you learn from it. Yeah. You know, it might be, you might do a course and think, yeah, that, you know, that was great. It's not necessarily, now I realise it's not necessarily what I want to do mm. vocationally, but hey, I learned all these other things through doing that. Yeah. You know, that may give you diff- more ideas about doing other things, you know. Mm. So it's, yeah, it's just about uh, thinking outside and, and, and I think that that's what this year has taught people, that we can't be just narrow-minded and stuck mm. on what we're doing. We really need to open up and, and look out there and, and not limit ourselves mm. that there are, there are other things we can do and other things we're capable of doing. Yeah. And if we need to, to do more training for that, well, that's what you do. Mm. And people, even older, you know, people who are sort of in their, in their ending years of their career have done that. You mm. know, think, well, I'm not quite ready yet. This pandemic's not going to be the early retirement of me. Yeah. I'm just going to retrain and reskill. Mm. in in another area and go for it you know a lot have gone into aged care and and services that are really you know booming there are a lot of booming services that that will always need people Mm. um so yeah it's just finding those and if we need to upskill doing that and there is so much help there to do that yeah Yeah. there you go sounds like you've kind of learnt this pre-2020 would you say yeah (laughs) yeah It's good because now you are more prepared for. Well, it's a shock to everybody when yeah. when that happens, and you know, like me, I've been stood down since March, so for nine months, mm. and we just got our next stand down letter until the end of February. So, you know, this is that's going to be a year. Yeah. So who would who would expect that? You know, mm. um, I mean, the airline industry has always been a volatile industry because anything that happens around the world affects airlines. True. So you know, nine eleven. Um, any global wars, anything like that. True. Um, fuel prices, the airlines were affected. Yeah. So, but no one quite guessed this this one because this is like extensive, just Correct. everything, everything. Correct. Because in in often what will happen in the airline industry it will affect one country or a few countries more than another. Yeah. So, for example, then pilots will then move overseas and take jobs with foreign airlines mm. in China or or the US or wherever. Um, but yeah, this is like everywhere, everyone. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I know I had one final question that I already asked, but because you said you already learnt this before 2020, this whole lesson of not being so limited, what has 2020 taught you? And this will be my final question now. <laughs> um, I think probably the, the hardest thing with 2020 is... is Things got taken away from us mm. involuntarily. So it wasn't our decision. Yeah. So for me, 2020, most of what 2020 has presented has been forced forced on us. So mm. we haven't been the ones in the driver's seat. You know, if you decide to change your vocation or your job or buy a property or, or whatever, you're the one making the decision. You're in yeah. the driver's seat. But this whole year, that's been the difficult thing for, for a lot of people is mm. that We've had that taken right out of our hands, so we we we've had to then re re grab the reins ourselves. Mm. Somebody else has been taking off with it. We've had to grab it back, and then get our own lives back on track and mm. say, okay, well, no, this is what we are doing. So, I think that's the biggest thing: just accepting that um, we weren't making the decisions for a while there. Yeah, you know, other people were, and there was so much uncertainty. Mm. especially in the early days you know now things are a bit more clearer and whilst some industries are still not coming back um we have got some clarity now we're in the mm. early you know as you know in the beginning it was like every day every week things were changing yeah. every so hour no, yeah exactly <laughs> there was no consistency yeah so that's we're not used to that we're, mm. we're not used to that so for a, for a lot of us that was a big lesson in 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 um not having that control over our lives and not knowing what was up next so mm. making decisions was difficult because you know we didn't we didn't know what was around the corner mm. but you know that has improved and hopefully that will continue to improve into next year without any setbacks and we can start taking full full reign again mm. <laughs> there you go i guess you could say well for me it's like the lesson is there's really no certainty in anything no matter how certain it may not look or feel 
it just takes one thing to to pull it all away yeah pull it all apart and as we always say when it's gone we're always like you know I mean, you don't appreciate it until it's gone. Yeah. So it's that complacency thing as well that we, we all do when we're very comfortable in something mm. uh, and we become complacent and then it's gone and we're like, you know, mm. boom. There you go. Wow. Well, I want to say a massive thank you You're for welcome. joining the show. Um, it's a huge privilege to chat with you and get your thoughts on a few things. And yeah, how do you feel being on your first this, would you say this is your first podcast? Podcast it is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 There you go. Well, um, thank you so much for tuning in to the Make Mondays Interesting podcast. This has been the season two premiere. And if you enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to engage with it. Well, that means commenting on the YouTube video, liking the YouTube video, um, on Spotify, following us, sharing us, Apple Podcasts, giving us a review. Um, do whatever, just do, just engage with us because the more people who engage with us helps us reach more and more people, which means we can make Mondays more interesting for those people. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Denzel Gaga. This has been a God-Given Talent production and I'll see you next week for another episode of Season 2.